Let's bring in former Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance, who first opened the investigation into former President Donald Trump in 2018, but left office before those charges were filed. This is his first interview since the indictment has been unsealed. Mr. Vance, thank you for joining us. First, uh, you since for you have... Thank you. Since you have um, knowledge of much of the information against Donald Trump, uh, your reaction to these 34 felony counts? Well, first, uh, Nora, my reaction is to the proceedings themselves. I think your excellent panel has all talked about the sobering nature of the proceeding. Uh, and I think, first of all, we should all take heart in the fact that the proceedings went off in an organized, calm, and deliberative manner. Uh, I think many thought that when this arraignment would take place, it would precipitate uh, violence outside the courtroom or near the district attorney's office. And at least as of this point, that has not happened, and that is good. I think it is a harbinger of how Judge Mershon is going to want to run this case. He's going to want to keep it on a tight schedule. He's going to want to control the conduct of the party so that they do not uh, have this uh, proceeding go off track. Uh, and I think, uh, as should be the case, I have hope that this will proceed in a way where the public will find out the relevant information at the trial uh, and a judgment will be rendered at the appropriate time by a Manhattan jury. Do you think that Donald Trump will be found guilty? Uh, I don't have the evidence. Uh, I've, I've gone through the indictment very quickly, and so that would be premature and, I think, uh, inappropriate for me to answer that question, uh, not knowing uh, so many of the facts that are particularly known by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. I will say that they've spent a lot of time on this, uh, and I think uh, they have obviously believed that they put together a solid case or they wouldn't have brought it. Uh, but the actual merits in a case like this uh, take uh, go through a lot of uh, a, a lot of checkpoints uh, where facts need to be proved, theories need to be tested, and your excellent panelists have discussed uh, many of those factors that are going to unfold in the coming months. Mr. Vance, I know that you originally greenlit this investigation. You brought on Mark Pomerantz, who's written a book about this, but ultimately. Uh, you left office before uh, any charges were brought, an indictment, and it took Alvin Bragg to move this forward. What happened in that time? Why was uh, Alvin Bragg able to bring an indictment that you were not? What, were, what pieces of the investigative puzzle were added, do you believe? Well, first of all, Nora, I think there's a, you know, there's a slightly more nuanced background. We did indict in the summer of 2021 the Trump Organization in 17 counts for a broad uh, tax fraud and conspiracy, along with its chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg. Uh, we first started down this road uh, in probably uh, 2017 neighborhood, and uh, we're investigating when the federal government commenced its investigation into the hush money payments. Uh, and that uh, the office asked our office to stand down on our investigation, and I said yes. I thought it was appropriate out of my respect for the U.S. Attorney's Office and their experience. Uh, but I was surprised when, after Michael Cohen pled guilty, uh, that the case seemed to have been dropped by the federal government. Uh, we had turned our attention on to financial investigations of uh, the Trump Organization and former president. I can say that without breaching confidence because I was sued by the president. Uh, and the office, uh, and in that lawsuit in federal court, he attached a copy of our grand jury subpoena, which typically is something that cannot be revealed unless you're the person receiving it. So for the next period of time, uh, we were investigating financial matters as outlined in the grand jury uh, subpoena. But what happened, of course, Nora, is COVID. And uh, COVID com was obviously very impactful on our ability to uh, get a grand jury, to compel evidence, to compel production of documents. And we and New York City and, the, and all over the country, we were uh, really unable to move in the traditional, using the traditional investigative techniques during that long time period. But uh, we continued to press ahead. And actually, in that time period, that other year and a half, uh, went to the Supreme Court twice, uh, through two district courts, through two separate panels of courts of appeal, and, two, and a full hearing before the Supreme Court. 
and ultimately the Supreme Court issued its ruling first that no man uh, or president, former president, was against being investigated, uh, and secondly that Mr. Trump and the organization had to produce this document. So when you say we didn't move forward, I just want to be clear that there was a lot of work done uh, that leads up to this day in earlier chapters. But in truth, in the summer of 2021, as I, my term was expiring, uh, we did not have uh, the time to complete the investigation, uh, the broader financial investigation that was underway, and uh, ultimately, uh, whatever decisions I made about going forward or not, I understood it was going to be the new district attorney's decision on what to focus on. And you see, since he became an office, came in office, this is, has been his focus. And Mr. Vance, thank you very much for that clarification. Um, it was your work that ultimately led the Supreme Court to deny Trump's final bid to block his tax returns that were ultimately turned over in what was a huge case that we covered, certainly um, from Washington when the Supreme Court made that. So uh, thank you for pointing that out, the work of your office and, and the prosecutors there. I want to ask you about the legal theory behind the current district attorney's case, which is essentially elevating these misdemeanors to a felony charge by linking them to a campaign finance violation. Is that a difficult case to prove? Well, I think it, it, my experience, as, as you have very ably, you and John have very ably explained with your panelists, uh, a false business record uh, charge is not new to the district attorney's office. It's sort of the equivalent of a conspiracy charge in federal court. So those are charged all the time. During my tenure, we did elevate a misdemeanor false business record charge to a felony uh, when it pertained to uh, other crimes that were intended for the creation of the false business record, including some federal crimes. But what is not what was not done during our office was to elevate it for purposes of proving that the false business record was designed to uh, violate federal election laws. That's something that was not done by my office. I'm not sure it has done by the office. That does not mean it is legally deficient. But I think, as others have said, this will be one of the early test points that the defense will bring, presumably in early motions to dismiss, uh, to take on that theory and to ask the court to rule that these counts cannot be elevated and therefore should remain as misdemeanors. Now, as Jerry Goldfeder said, the objects uh, of the false business records in some instances may be violations of state election law. That's going to be, again, another uh, focused effort by the defense to, you know, to figure what, ha what happened there. At the end of the day, Judge Mershon is going to, I think, early on or within a reasonable period of time, issue legal rulings on these fundamental preliminary uh, law issues. And I think that's where we'll see the first efforts of the defense. Thank you, Mr. Vance. And uh, John Dickerson is here as well. Uh, my question, uh, Mr. Vance, hi, um, is, is in, in what we have before us, um, it talks about how uh, the defendant, Donald J. Trump, orchestrated a scheme from August 2015 to December 2017. And before we've had this information, we've mostly been talking about the hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. What appears to be the case here, and my question to you is, is this a narrative technique or is this a, a legal argument, which is essentially, it seems to be arguing that Donald Trump started a conspiracy in 2015 that was this entire catch and kill and that the entire catch and kill idea was a campaign violation that it was orchestrated John, from its yeah go ahead uh, I didn't I apologize for interrupting you um, I obviously haven't had time nor have you to scrutinize the indictment in my quick pass through I didn't see a conspiracy count maybe there is one um, and if there is please tell me but you're talking about essentially sort of a, what we call a speaking indictment, which is an indictment that uh, provides just more than bare bone facts, but that also provides some explanation of the underlying conduct, which is used uh, as a public document to explain to the public the underlying basis for the charges. Uh, what I principally saw was uh, false business record counts. Uh, and it looks like there are several different time periods and involving different people where it was done, one with the doorman, one perhaps with Karen McDougal, and another one with Stormy Daniels. Uh, that's what I see as the gravamen of the charges. But it is a story, and it's just, I mean, cases are tried as stories. And I think the story that will be put forth here is a multiple-year conspiracy uh, to uh, violate state and election laws 
uh, by uh, manipulating the internal books, ledger, ledgers, checks uh, of the company. Michael Cohen's potential testimony, how would it factor into this case in the coming months? Uh, Mr. Cohen obviously is going to be attacked very heavily uh, by the defense. They're, they will paint him as a liar and unbelievable. But as I've said before, and as someone who has tried many, many, many cases uh, with individuals who have criminal records as principal witnesses for the prosecution, you take your witnesses where you find them. And the question really will be, uh, what is the quality of the corroborative evidence outside of Michael Cohen's say-so that a jury can rely upon to believe Michael Cohen when he says something happened? So the quality of the corroborative evidence will be key. Now, if we have false ledgers mm -hmm. and checks and the like, uh, and Mr. Cohen can tie those, uh, care, tie those tightly uh, with his behavior, uh, that, will, that will, in some sense, bolster Mr. Cohen's credibility, even though it will be heavily attacked. And finally and foremost, he worked for Donald Trump. And so while we, one can say whatever you want to say, there was a proximity between himself and Mr. Trump and a closeness, which I think will be a factor the jury will consider as it looks at Mr. Trump's credibility, this is Mr. Cohen's credibility. Former Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance Jr., Mr. Vance, thank you so much. We appreciate it.